Friends, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of M. Frank Johnson. We come together in our grief, acknowledging our human loss. And we pray that God would grant us the grace that in pain we might find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. At this moment, all who are able, we are invited to stand as we sing our opening hymn, Morning Has Broken. Please be seated. And let us pray. Holy and amazing God, the God who is with us when we draw in that very first breath of life, and the God who holds our hand as we exhale our last, we praise you for being the God of all the moments in between. We thank you, God, for being present with us in this time where we're wrestling with the reality that one we love and care about is no more, and somewhat with the side that they are no longer in discomfort. We pray right now, God, for a family that is going to navigate their next, where their family circle has been broken, where friends will no longer be able to uh, call and hear the voice of one they're used to hearing that moment when we think we can pick up the phone and get advice from a dad or from a grandfather or from a brother, we are navigating that void that Frank's death has created. So God, we ask you to fill that space with your presence. Envelop each and every person with your assuring comfort that lets them know that even in this moment, it will be all right. God, comfort as only you can. Breathe your breath of love and peace over each and every person gathered in this sacred space that they might know that you are present with them, that you will walk with them along this journey. This is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen.
Our scripture reading for today is taken from the New Testament epistles to the church in Galatia, Galatians 5, verse 22, and it reads as thus. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness. The word of God for the people of God, and we give thanks to God.
I have often said there are many things we are able to rearrange or reschedule. There are appointments we can postpone and others we can move up to accommodate our calendars. But there are two appointments over which we have absolutely no control. Those appointments are the day that we will be born and the day that we will die. Now, despite medical advancements and no matter how hard we hold fast to our health regimens, uh, even living our very best lives, eating all the spinach that you can. <laughs> the day will come when each of us will release our hold on life on this side to grab hold of life in eternity. And it is how we have lived between the moment of our birth and our death that determines the essence of our existence, the story our lives will tell. Now, beloved, each of you holds a treasure that I was not and will not be privileged to hold. When I arrived at St. Paul, Frank and Bonnie had relocated, yet they remained a part of the life here at our church. My relationship with them was limited to cards and emails, a convenient way to connect, but understandably a way that was void of the sacredness of meeting one-to-one, -one, face to face. All of you here are blessed to have known Frank. Whether you knew him as dad, life partner, fellow tenor or neighbor, coworker, the stories you can tell and the memories you hold are precious gifts that death cannot destroy. And that, beloved, will be the eternal and forever gift. You will be blessed to unwrap day after day, moment after moment, month after month. It will be a gift that keeps on giving because there's no way you can ever lose that gift because it rests in your heart. As news of Frank's death was shared with the choir, one theme began to recur, and it was the title of the song that you'll hear when I finish. And it was, in my mind, the song that best describes what I have heard and come to know about Frank. And the title was, I Wonder As I Wander. Now, Webster's Dictionary defines a wanderer as someone who goes about life aimlessly without a plan or destination, just drifting through life without care or responsibility. But beloved, I would argue that nothing could be further from the truth. I would argue that wanderers have a destination in mind, not always a physical place, but a place nonetheless a place to which they are traveling without hurry or concern. They're gonna get there when they get there and no matter how much you try to scooch them along and nudge them and make them go, they go at their own pace, on their own route, in their own time. The seeking of this place to which they travel caused them to travel and it may seem to others like the rest of us that they have no clue where they're going. Because if it were us, we'd know where we were going. We'd do this and we'd do that and it would be in perfect order. We would travel this route, all our ducks would be in a row. Wanderers do not see life through that lens. Wanderers may seem to others as though they're wasting time, but they are embracing and enjoying the things so many of us tend to overlook. They are, they are on the forever hunt for wonder and for joy. Now, as I saw the scripture fitting for this occasion, I was led to the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 21. And I want to read it from the message translation because sometimes the message translation just says it in a way nobody else can say it. Forgive me, King James. <laughs> Matthew 6, 21 says, the place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be. And it is the place you will end up being. In what might be considered one of Jesus' best sermons, Jesus is preaching to a crowd that has followed him to the hillside, captivated by his teaching. 
The essence of this sermon is teaching people how to live, pointing out what really matters in life, and encouraging all to live in the comforting assurance that Jesus is always with them. In this particular portion of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus calls people away from the very many things that tend to trap us. I said us. It's easy to point fingers at them, but we get trapped and distracted by so many things, the rigors of life, the worries over things that we cannot control. Jesus encourages this mountainside congregation to, in many respects, just loosen up and live life to its fullest. Okay, so I know I'm being recorded, so don't take this literally, but sometimes you can't live life by the rules. Sometimes the best way to live life is kind of wandering through it, trying to figure out what's next on your own. Maybe some people go this way, but you need to go that way. And either way you go, you end up where God intends you to be. Jesus encourages his mountainside congregation to live life to its fullest, to keep the main thing the main thing, and the main thing is always seeking God. Now, beloved, you can't find God if you're not looking for God. And I would offer that those wandering in search of God have figured out that you can't always find God if you keep looking in the same place for God. Now, in a few minutes, Frank's daughter will share words that speak to the life of this sweet soul that we have gathered to celebrate. But in this moment, we are reminded that while the responsibilities of adulthood require us to be Adults. Adulthood stinks, doesn't it? Am I the only one that just does not like adulting? I mean, I've been doing it for like 60 plus years and it hadn't gotten any more fun as far as I can tell. But we have some important responsibilities that we cannot abdicate simply because life gets difficult. There are requirements and responsibilities that we must tend to. But we still cannot allow ourselves to become so consumed by the doing of life that we forget to be in life. In every word that others have shared with me about Frank, Frank knew how to be. Hmm. The question is, do we? Do we know how to be comfortable knowing that we are not in control of our lives? Do we know how to be content even in the midst of life's trials and tribulations? Do we know how to be excited about the things that we tend to hurry past day to day, the rising of the sun, the, the, the wind that's trying to whip us down the street, the smell of fresh flowers, the memory, the sound of a guitar being picked in the melody that that jogs our memory, the smell of your favorite meal being cooked. Do we know how to be? Are we just too busy doing? Beloved, none of us knows the day of, or the hour in which God will call us from this life to the next. We have no idea if the next moment or the next day is our last. But the question remains, what story do we want our lives to tell? In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus reminds those gathered in us as well that there is more to life than the acquiring and the doing, the overwhelming schedules, the packed Google calendars with no empty spaces. Jesus reminds us how to be, to be present with nature, to be present with each other, to be present with God. In other words, to allow ourselves the privilege of wandering. For when you wander, you never know what gift of God you may stumble upon in an unexpected place. Now Frank's wandering has led him to eternal rest, where I believe the gates of heaven were thrown open upon his arrival where the angelic bluegrass choir got together with heavenly guitars in hand, singing a soulful hallelujah, welcome to their newest tenor and faithful wanderer. May our wandering lead us to that same wonderful reward. Well done, Frank Johnson.
well done. had wanted for any weak thing, a star in the sky, or a bird on the wing, or all of God's angels in heaven for to sing, he surely could have had it, cause he was the king. I wonder as I wonder sky, how Jesus the Savior did come for to die, for poor ornery people like you and like I. I wonder as I wonder Beloved, there are many who are gathered here who have a story or two to tell about Frank. And we could probably be here till Jesus indeed comes back, but I assure you we will not. But I will uh, open this time up if there are some who would like to come forward and share their reflections about Frank. Please feel free to come up. I would advise that you come this way and hold to the handrail to come up here and speak from the lectern. If there are any, please, at this time, you are invited to come. Good evening, morning, evening. <laughs> it's been a long while. So uh, my name's Roy Moore. I am Frank Johnson's son-in-law, married to Sherry. And uh, I first met Frank when Sherry and I started dating when she was 19. We've been married 36 years, yay. Frank, um, my story about him is, uh, he had caught wind that we were talking about getting married. And I was standing in the kitchen and doing something in the kitchen there. And he came in and he put his arm around me and he says, I hear you and Shares are talking about marriage. He called her Shares. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I would be honored to be your father-in-law. And I thought to myself, well, if things don't work out. I'm definitely keeping him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that 
you know, that summed it up for me, and I'm going to tell one more. Uh, shortly after that, you know, Sherry and I were, uh, we were living in um, New Carrollton, and she came to me one day, and she says, well, I've, I've got this event coming up, and I need a new dress. And uh, I said, well, sweetie, we, we just got married, and things are not financially well. Uh, maybe you can put that on a burner. Maybe wear something you already have. And I thought that was the end of it. I did. So I, I come home from work and went in the bedroom, and there's two silk dresses laying on the bed there. I said, well, where do these dresses come from? And she says, my daddy gave me his Visa card. <laughs> I said, oh, really? So I went stomping off in the kitchen, and I snatched the phone off the wall and dialed him up. I said, Frank, you listen here. I'm the man of my house, and Sherry's now my wife, and, and she's going to have to do it out until I'm able to provide. And Frank said quietly, he didn't say a word. Then he says, are you finished? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. Now, don't get offended about what I'm getting ready to say. He said, listen here, little boy. <laughs> Sherry is my daughter, and whatever she needs, I'm going to get for her. Do you understand that? I said, yes, sir. Thank you, and have a great day. <laughs> Hung up the phone. 36 years, not another word of any anger or frustration. Wonderful father-in-law, great family, and he, he, he's, he was a true gift to me and my family, so he will, he will definitely be sorely missed. Thank you. I bet that's a hard act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> If there are no others, then we invite the choir to come in honor with music.
Good morning. You guys are going to have to be a little patient with me. My knees are knocking just a little bit, but I am wearing waterproof mascara, so all should be good. Good morning. I'm Kelly Hall, Frank's eldest daughter. My family and I would like to thank Pastor Pat for her kind, uplifting, and spiritual message this morning. We would also like to thank all of those at St. Paul's who have made today's service possible, and it's all of you for attending. I would like to share a brief summary of my dad's life as it relates to our family. I know that many have known him for a number of years, so it will serve as a remembrance, but for others it may offer a new glimpse into who he was before you knew him. The two things that I find most remarkable about my father are that first, he was raised in a home that did not embrace diversity. In fact, his parents taught a different message entirely. I say this not to disparage my grandparents because as most grandchildren, I love my grandparents unconditionally. My nana and granddaddy both passed when I was still a teenager. As I grew older though, I realized how astounding it was that my dad, who had been raised to look for the differences in others and feel superior to some, became someone entirely different. He was, simply put, the kindest man that I've ever known. He was patient and giving, except for when driving, he had horrible road rage. <laughs> he looked for the similarities in our spirits and for the good in everyone. We are so fortunate to have been his children and to have had the opportunity to learn how to treat others by his example. The second thing that I find most remarkable is how at such a young age, he knew that he wanted a family and committed himself to being the best husband and father that anyone could ever have imagined, much less expected him to be. He was 23 years old. With a degree in radio and television broadcasting, a talented musician who had numerous paths available to him, and yet he chose to work at Mizell's Hardware in Kensington and prioritize the soon to be emerging bunch of us. Kristen, the youngest, is our Thanksgiving baby, literally. My mom was in labor at Thanksgiving dinner. She came into the world with a full head of hair and won all of our hearts. My parents' original plan for having eight children was amended. That was probably a good idea because I do believe that at that time we still lived in a three bedroom, one bath home, which may have had an additional bedroom and bathroom in the basement, which obviously was not up to code. Um, She's our baby sister and the perfect final chapter to our family. Kristen later became a mom to Jamie, Shelby, and Kirk Jr., as well as being a stepmom to her husband Kirk's daughters. She's a talented cook and gardener. Kristen lives in the home that we grew up in, and that was where dad visited on choir nights for dinner during the years that he was still able to make the drive from Winchester. Kristen came to visit dad in his final days despite a tremendous fear of hospitals. It was a true demonstration of love and strength on her part. Sean, the youngest son, is our daredevil. He had the motorcycle, the fast cars, and as an adult became a police officer. He loved all roller coasters and climbing things as a kid. With that need for speed, the occasional ER visit was required. So I'm sure that he was the source of many of the gray hairs on my father's head. My dad was so proud of Sean's service and knew that he could count on him to be there when it mattered. If we had an emergency in our family, Dad's first call would always be to Sean. He also gave Dad two grandchildren, Corey and Amelia Grace. We have a beautiful family photo that includes Dad from Corey's wedding, and it's a memory that we all tre treasure. I will always be grateful to Sean for the nights that he spent at Dad's bedside in Winchester and that he was with him in his final moments in Statesville. Sherry's our middle girl, and man, had I been waiting a long time by that point for a sister. She has always been a nurturer and never more than through this ordeal. When it became necessary to find the best place for dad to spend his last few weeks, she used her expertise and went into action. We could not have done this without her. Sherry and her husband, Randy, have two children, Josh and Melanie, and she's a stepmom to Nick and a grandma to Nicholas, Adam and Savannah, and very recently, a great-grandma to Nico. My sister and I are the steel magnolias in the family. Laughter through tears is our favorite emotion. She, like my dad, 
is pure kindness coupled with the strength to support those around her. Kevin is our Florida farmer. He's also a photographer, a beekeeper, active in his church, a jack of all trades. Kevin has four children. First came Brandon and Brent, and then Michelle and Melissa with his wife, Deb. He was and is a hard worker, having jobs from a young age. He was also the reason that the family acquired Captain the Biting Devil Dog. <laughs> if I recall correctly, we inherited that terrifying dog because Kevin worked for a pet store as a teen, and Captain wasn't exactly a hot ticket item. Somehow, Kevin convinced my mom, dad would have been on board anyway, that he needed to save the dog from certain demise, and they complied. Scott, who also lives in Florida, worked with dad for many years at Builders Hardware. He's a talented carpenter with a sardonic wit that can send us all into giggles. He's also an accomplished photographer. He possesses dad's peaceful demeanor and loves to fish, so I suppose that also means that he must have dad's patience. He's our tallest sibling at six foot six, so he rep represents the bird side of our family. My mom, who met dad at this very church, was Linda Bird, daughter of Harold Bird, and a very involved participant in St. Paul's history, who, though not a carpenter by trade, helped with the trim work throughout the church after the fire uh, at St. Paul's. Scott has two children, Maxine and Tyler. He was also a father to Marshall, who sadly was only on this earth briefly, but I'm sure he will be a part of the welcome committee for his granddad, and dad will be so happy to meet him. Dad's eldest son, Jeffrey, as well as Jeff's son, Jesse, will also be there to welcome Dad in heaven. We lost them 30 plus years ago, and it left a hole in all of our hearts. My brother was a troubled soul, but my dad never gave up on him and found a way to show him that he was loved every single day that he was on this earth. Dad has kept Jeff's ashes for all of these years so that they could be placed in the, together in the columbarium. Jeff had Matthew McConaughey good looks, with a brilliant smile, a love for animals, and I believed, actually until just a few minutes ago, that he was the only one of Dad's kids that was not tone deaf. But my brother Kevin just told me today that he actually can sing. So, who knew? And initially, there was me. Born to a 19-year-old mother and a 23-year-old father that had very little money. They somehow scraped together enough to buy a home in which to raise their kids. My mother sewed our clothes, and we dined on what we affectionately called daddy slop, which was canned tomatoes, noodles, and hamburger, because spaghetti sauce for all those kids was too expensive. My dad could make tuna sandwiches for all of us from one single can of tuna. Just imagine that for a second. It was tuna paste. And he also made the best pancakes in the world. For entertainment, we would all pile into the station wagon and go for rides all about Montgomery County and DC. Understand, we're talking the old time model station wagons with the rear facing seat. I'm not even sure if they had seat belts back there. And what could possibly go wrong with this plan? Well, thankfully nothing did. We were happy even when it was hectic and our dad was always there to make us laugh, give horsey rides, sing to us and say things like, was anyone hurt when the hurricane hit if he came home to a messy house? Or, were you raised in a barn when we left a door open? Or rarely, when we had collectively asked at least a million questions in a single day and he'd actually gotten just a little tired of answering them, he'd go, why, are you writing a book? Most importantly though, he was there to set an example as to how to love ourselves despite our faults, love our family and those around us. I've gone on to have two children, Jeremy, the second kindest man that I've ever known. He's also been waiting patiently for dad in heaven. And Ryan, my youngest, funny and kind in his own right, married to his beautiful wife, Nicole. I have the pleasure of being the stepmother to my husband, Tim's four kids, Michael, PJ, Jenna and Brandon, and the Murr, my grandma name, to Brooklyn and Jameson. When Jeremy passed, I wanted to sprinkle some of his ashes in my father's garden. 
And dad, who almost says no to any, or almost never says no, said, absolutely not. He's going with me in the vault. So a bit of germ will also be interred with dad and Jeff. I'm so happy to think of all of them together with no burdens to carry. Ooh. <laughs> okay. After we became adults, our dad moved to Winchester where he lived until his last days. His partner and best friend Bonnie was his lasting love for decades. She and dad were avid pet parents, loved their neighbors, and the entire Winchester community. He continued to participate in the St. Paul's Choir until he couldn't make the drive any longer, and he also played in various bands in Virginia. One of my last and favorite memories of my dad will always be when he sang along to the seldom scenes, wait a minute, in the hospital recently. He didn't really have the pipes for the full Frank version, but that made it all that more beautiful. A few of us recently had the pleasure of visiting them both in Old Town Winchester where Dad had a beer and a Reuben, which he inhaled, by the way. And it was a great day. I know that Bonnie misses him terribly. I'm grateful that he found his soulmate to live out the remainder of his life with. I tell you all this because one man has created such a legacy of kindness. He was a musician, a Rotarian, a JC, a member of St. Paul's, a neighbor, a friend, and most importantly to us anyway, a parent. I know that I don't have his patience, nor nearly the grace that he possessed, but I do think that he rubbed off on me just enough, and also on my brothers and sisters, so that we could keep paying it forward to our kids and to our kids' kids. So for me, my talented, brilliant, funny, and handsome dad will always be a part of me when I feel empathy, love, or a sense of responsibility, and I'll know he's still here. There's a song that I listen to when I'm feeling the need to connect with the son that I've lost, and I think that it applies to my dad as well. I'm definitely not able to carry a tune, so I'll not be singing. But the chorus says, far from here and we are happy, far from here and we are all right, far from here things are peaceful, Far from here, we have insight. Far from here, we are, we've detangled our strangled hold, and I hope to see you there. I believe it took an effort for my dad to let go because he felt he needed to stay for our sakes. He didn't know how to put himself first. I wish him peace and happiness, and I hope I will see him there. Thank you.
Beloved, we have just a few instructions before we depart from this sacred place under the covering of the benediction. Once the benediction has been offered, then allow me the moment to get down and around without falling down and to help lead the family to the octagon where you are all invited to join them for a reception. May we receive the benediction. Holy God, we have come into this sacred place, our hearts heavy, but still strangely light, knowing that one we love and care for, one who has traveled life's journey with us, is now resting comfortably, peaceably, and fully with you. Now, God, we pray for those of us who are left behind that as we leave this place, that we would wander along the path of life that you have charted for us, trusting that every place we wander, we will embrace your wonder. This is our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.